Good afternoon. I'm Steve Levine. I'm a Schwartz Fellow here at the New America Foundation. Um, today we have Michael Levi, the author of a new book. Today is the launch of his book, The Power Surge. We're lucky to be the launching pad for, for him. Um, Michael um, comes from an unusual background to be looking at energy. He's got an undergraduate degree in physics. He went on to get a master's degree in mathematical uh, physics, studying string theory and cosmology, and then got his PhD in um, war studies. And one, one, of the, one of the questions, is this a line of study that you recommend for energy analysts? I think it's great. It's uh, basically one of these hangovers of the 50s and 60s and 70s when political science departments became obsessed with uh, do, only doing things where you could do statistics and formal models. And so uh, the, a political science department at the University of London sort of uh, had half of their people break off. Uh, their historians broke off. Some of the political scientists did. They brought in some technology folks and uh, continued to take a more holistic look at international relations. So I think it's great. All right. So. Um, Today we're on the record. Uh, this session is being live webcast. Um, when we get to the Q&A, um, please wait for the mic. State who you are and, and go ahead and ask your question. We're, we're at the uh, beginning stages right now. We have been for the last two or three years of a brand new age in energy, uh, perhaps the most turbulent age since uh, modern energy began in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, a lot of moving parts, a boom in gas, a boom in oil, technology, and um, this is what Michael is, is latching onto, and he uh, calls this book the first major study of, of the New Age, of how um, uh, the boom is affecting geopolitics and American policy, and it and it is, and it's a terrific book, and I recommend it. Um, why don't we start out, Mike, if, if you don't mind. You, in the book yourself, start out by laying down the basement, laying down the historical foundation of our current age. Do you want to start with the 1970s, just sort of capsulate how we got here? Absolutely. First, thank you for having me here today. It's great to be at the New America Foundation to talk about this book and to talk about what's happening in American energy. One of the things I got to do when I was writing this book was transport myself to the 1970s by reading memoirs, reading newspapers, looking at how the debate over energy unfolded the last time we were experiencing major change in American energy. And, and really, you do need to go back to the late 1960s, early 1970s to see a period with this much change. Uh, at the time, you had the first oil crisis, the first Earth Day, which we uh, just saw the 40th anniversary of uh, a week or two ago, uh, the continuing rise at the time of nuclear power. Uh, you had a host of different changes in the energy scene, but also different changes in the world. And so all at the same time, people were grappling with what to do about energy and how to find uh, our footing when it came to the environment, when it came to the economy, when it came to national security. Throughout the 1970s, uh, in the aftermath, particularly of the first oil crisis, you had a, a very intense debate. Uh, and you had a debate that, that pitted advocates of uh, essentially doubling down on fossil fuels, growing supply as the answer to our problems, and people who advocated a very different energy path. Uh, they talked about it as a soft energy path, where the focus was on efficiency and on alternative energy sources. And both sides largely agreed, or at least asserted, that the two routes were exclusive. You had to pick one or you had to pick the other. As I read it, this all culminated in the 1980 election. I spent a lot of time reading about the 1980 election during last year's election season, and it sounded awfully familiar. The rhetoric was very similar. Uh, on one side, uh, focusing on opportunities to grow supply and putting down the importance of curbing demand and promoting alternatives, and on the other side, really dismissing uh, opportunities that come from oil and gas and, at the time, nuclear power. So there was this sharp split. Uh, the 1980 election happened. Uh, 
there was a decisive win, at least politically. In the 1980s, you saw uh, essentially a hands-off approach from government to energy. For a while, that worked, uh, particularly as you were coming out of a period of, deregulation, of, of heavy regulation. Uh, you did see decreasing demand, and you saw increasing supplies. But as time went on, uh, that largely petered out. And if you look 10 years uh, beyond that, what you basically had was uh, stagnation and then decline in U.S. Uh, oil and gas production. Uh, you saw eventually a moratorium on new offshore drilling. At the same time, you stopped tightening fuel economy standards on cars and trucks, and the fuel economy of our cars and trucks stagnated. And we started starving uh, clean energy of support from government. So neither side really got what they wanted except for to knock the other one down. We coasted along for a few decades on that until uh, we got to the place where we are today, or at least the place we were a few years ago before things started to change again. All right. So every, it's, it's not new anymore. Everyone's heard about this. The boom in gas, the boom in oil, the Bakken shale, the Barnett shale, and, 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 and all the repercussions of that. And, and you frame this interestingly how the 1970s were about, for Americans, trauma suddenly we were no longer in control of ourselves, of our own destiny. And the decades since then have been, how can we get that back? And that is how, I think what you're saying, that is how Americans and American policymakers are viewing it now. But you don't see it exactly that way. Well, I see opportunities here, but I don't see the same transform, sort of fundamentally transformative outcome that some people claim. Uh, there's a habit, uh, maybe it's not unique to the energy world, of insisting either that a development doesn't matter at all or that it's going to change everything in the world. And the reality is that this is somewhere in between. Uh, oil and gas production are increasing. It's helping hold down greenhouse gas emissions. It's increasing economic activity uh, on the gas side in particular, making us more secure in the world. But that doesn't mean that we're now going to be energy independent in a meaningful way, that this is going to solve our fundamental economic problems or deal with climate change. Uh, but we have this habit of grasping for those answers. And I think the 70s do reveal that this is not a novel phenomenon. This is what you do when you don't know what's going on in the world. When you're scared, you grasp for answers. And sometimes you overread developments and uh, expect too much out of them. I worry that when we expect too much out of particular developments, we make bad decisions. Uh, when everything is in, in extremes, uh, you tend to go to extremes in order to make sure that it delivers, and that often plays out uh, quite poorly. All right, so, so we're going to divide our, our talk into, we'll, we'll talk about the United States, we'll talk about technology and climate, and then we'll get to foreign policy. So sticking on onto the, the U.S. part, you, you say in, in an optimistic scenario, you say we could add 5 million barrels a day to U.S. production. But you say that it peaks and then it comes down. So therefore, it's not, uh, it's not this answer that optimists seek. Uh, what is it then? Well, a lot depends on the choices we make. I think you could add more than that to U.S. supply. You could add less than that. And I go through a variety of different sources of supply. You're talking... Uh, about one scenario that I outlined, but I, I talk about the different uh, potential gains from offshore drilling to tight oil to enhanced oil recovery with carbon dioxide. Part of what convinces me that this is a trend that's likely to be sustained is that it comes from multiple sources. Uh, but over the longer run, there are some constraints to what can happen. Uh, the first uh, is one that might be imposed, and, and that's a carbon constraint. I don't think that that automatically hits uh, U.S. oil production, I think, for the foreseeable future, even if the world got pretty serious on climate change, we'd continue to have relatively high oil prices that would make it profitable to invest in these areas. But over time, a serious effort on climate change would bring oil prices down and deter U.S. production. The second piece is more fundamental. Even if you did, let's say, double U.S. oil production or triple U.S. oil production, uh, it, wouldn't, it, it might allow you to use the words energy independence in the sense that an accountant might talk about there being balance on his... Uh, on the form that he fills out, but that doesn't actually mean we would be independent. I think we conflate this jargon with some actual state of the world in a fairly unproductive way. And the, the basic logic behind it, behind why this doesn't make us uh, independent in a fundamental way is straightforward. Prices are set on world markets, events on the other side of the world affect us here even if we produce our own oil. And critically, the fact that during a crisis uh, money would 
go from an American consumer to American producer would not shield us fully from the brunt of, of an oil shock because producers don't spend money as quickly as consumers do. This is one of the things I was surprised to learn when I was reading the book. I assumed that at some point between 1973 and now, uh, the economics profession had figured out uh, how vulnerable we are or aren't to oil shocks, and how much it matters if we produce our oil here as opposed to importing it. It turns out that there was an intense debate in the 1980s about our vulnerability, and it, was, it, it came to some conclusions. The 1973 uh, oil shock caused part of the stagflation in the next decade, but not all of it. Uh, but we still continue to this day to debate how much uh, oil shocks hurt the economy, and there's almost nothing that's done to look at how much domestic production might or might not insulate us. It's really shocking how little we've dug into some of these things that we talk about every day. Let me flag one last piece, though. Let's imagine that you were to double US production in short order. And at the same time, Canadian production grows. And as a lot of folks assume, Iraqi production grows in a significant way. It's not clear that there's space in the world for all of that oil production. And at some point, if people are producing a lot more oil than anyone wants to consume, prices have to fall. Now, that would only last for a relatively short period of time because falling prices would crush that US production that had stimulated increased, uh, increased oil supplies and the price drop in the first place. But it could be, uh, it could be pretty tough for a couple years. Uh, it puts a real limit on how much you can add US supplies to the market. When I look at some of the studies out there where a team will put out one study saying we're going to have massive growth in supply and another study saying no one's going to want oil anymore, I have to ask where do these pieces all add together? If you're producing that much more, you do need somewhere for it to go. Right, so, so this, is, this is a big question about the studies that are out there. Let's, uh, let's just dive into what you just said. So the, the, uh, the forecast, the geopolitical forecasts we see, the geostrategic forecasts uh, of the salutary impact for the United States uh, financially, balance of payments, and, and, and so on, rely on uh, they the U.S. becomes an energy independent or whatever, you know, when you count in Mexico and Canada and so on. But everything else, all the other moving parts have to stay the same. They don't just have to stay the same. Everyone has to cooperate and help us let this happen. There's one study, I won't attribute it, but it floats around uh, U.S. government circles and some outside that projects a middle case of a 10 million barrel a day increase in U.S. supply. So that's almost a tripling of U.S. supplies with a high case of 15 million. This is a spectacular change, and they project this in the next seven years. And then they say, well, this will ba we will balance supply and demand because uh, OPEC countries, Saudi Arabia and others, will decide to hold something like 10 million barrels a day of oil off the market in order for supply and demand to balance and prices to stay high so we can continue to do that. Now, that's basically Saudi Arabia unilaterally deciding to go out of the oil export business. That's not a great assumption to make if you want to look at the future. Uh, so I think we have to be really careful with these. I'll give you one other example. The International Energy Agency, uh, last year, its projections said supply is going to keep going up, demand is going to be pretty stagnant, and countries will hold six or seven million barrels a day of oil off the market. Again, it, it ascribed this to a potential fear premium. I don't want to get into the technical details, but I don't find that all that plausible. Uh, there are ways to square rising supply and relatively stagnant demand. But I think we need to think through those, uh, those pretty carefully. Look, I, when I was writing the book, one of the more interesting conversations I had was with the Secretary General of OPEC. And I went and asked him, how do you feel about all this? Uh, will OPEC be able to handle it? And, and he basically said, yes, you know, we just don't invest quite as much. We don't grow quite as much. But we allow prices to stay high, and everyone gets what they want. And I think he's right up to a point. But when you get to some of these more extreme projections and more extreme expectations for what will happen, I think some of the assumptions fall apart. Something has to give uh, somewhere or other. Right. Um, let's, le let's throw in one more moving part, jobs. So, yes. so here, part of the last presidential election and probably the uh, election next year will be the impact of um, uh, energy on, on jobs and why aren't federal lands opened up and offshore and so on and so on. And, uh, and so you, you quote the reports that are out there, API, uh, 
the American Petroleum Institute, which is quoting IHS, uh, U.S. energy industry supports 9.2 million jobs. It will add 3 million new jobs by 2020. Three and a half million more jobs after that, 2035, from unconventional. Uh, you're not so sure. So one of the things I do throughout this book is take various estimates that are out there and pick them apart. Explain to people how you actually get to those and then ask, are the assumptions and are the techniques uh, correct? So let's take the most obvious one you started with that people talk about there being nine million jobs uh, related to the energy industry and there's this casual extrapolation well if we let's say double oil production maybe we'll double that number of jobs well given that a large fraction of those jobs are things like uh, service stations that's that kind of uh, reading out from the baseline doesn't work we're not going to have twice as many gas stations just because we're producing twice as much oil it gets trickier when you really drill down so the other the other big constraint historically in thinking about job impacts of uh, new industries is that when the economy is healthy, you don't really add jobs by creating new industries. You add wealth, but the level of employment in the country is determined by more fundamental things like Federal Reserve policy and how easily people move from one job to the other. Right now, we're in a weaker economy. And so you actually can add jobs in an absolute sense. You're not just moving people from one job to another. You're creating jobs. So I think the basic estimates of the number of jobs that could be created in, uh, directly in oil and gas industry uh, are pretty solid. Uh, we heard about a couple hundred thousand jobs uh, probably being created in oil and gas over the last few years directly in the industry uh, and, if, and maybe a similar number upstream. So people who supply steel and cement and catering service and everything you need at the drill sites. I think those are pretty solid. Uh, there's a more complicated bit of territory where you talk about induced jobs. These are the jobs that you get when people making money in the industry go out and spend. And some of that's real. I, I met someone in uh, northeastern Ohio when I was traveling for the book who told me that she had been asked to keep her diner open till four in the uh, at four in the morning and hire new people in order to support it. She'd also taken in boarders above her house. So some of that is new jobs. Uh, some of that uh, is continuing old jobs in a different way. She still would have been running the diner. She just wouldn't have hired other people. So you've got to parse this out pretty carefully. I think as we look out at 2020 and 2030, it's much more difficult than it is now to say this will add lots of new jobs in an absolute way because we should be back to a more healthy economy by then. At that point, we're talking more about wealth than jobs. Uh, but uh, as, at a minimum, as an insurance policy, it's a good thing. Uh, one of my uh, favorite parts of the, the book is a chapter where I talk about wild cards and uh, what happens to the analysis and the understanding uh, in the book and more broadly if you um, if some of the basic assumptions are wrong and one of the assumptions I ask about is what if we're wrong about the economy returning to full strength within uh, a few years what if we're really lagging for a much longer time and in that case this has a much larger potential to add jobs Taking a consumer dollar and paying it to a U.S. company is like throwing 75 cents in the trash. It's a quote let's from your the, book. Let's add the sentences before and after that. Uh, it, 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 the, <laughs> no, but that, so here's the context. It's a, it's a, I think it was something that I found really interesting when I looked into it. So what you're talking about is what happens if there's a spike in the price of oil. How does the U.S. economy respond? Because the casual understanding, and this used to be my understanding, was that if you had a spike in the price of oil and the United States was producing all of its own supplies, you would take money from a consumer and put, give it in a company, but the country would still be roughly the same. And so we would be insulated from the economic impacts of oil shocks. It turns out that in the short run, that's not true. Uh, the typical consumer doesn't have a lot of money. If you put an extra dollar in their pocket, they spend it. The typical company does have more money. Uh, the typical shareholder has more money, the typical executive has more money, and so it takes longer for them to spend whatever they get quickly. So if you have a sudden surge in the price of oil and you're, you're taking a dollar from a consumer who tends to spend and putting it in a typical company, yeah, 75 cents of that dollar roughly, and this is controversial, these are controversial numbers, but the order of magnitude isn't wrong, maybe about 75 cents on the dollar doesn't get spent quickly. And that is a hit to the economy. Now, I take pains to say that that doesn't mean that uh, moving, that, that 
corporate profits are not good and that this money doesn't eventually get spent in profitable ways. Ultimately, it gets returned to shareholders, put into the broader economy, invested in additional production. But that takes time. Uh, and in the meantime, there's a lot of pain that the economy goes through. So we have to continue to be aware of that. Uh, if, if we're not aware of it theoretically and we get to the point where we're producing all of our own oil, we'll find it out practically when the price of oil spikes and the economy still gets hurt. Okay, j uh, just to clarify, I'm, I'm just about to move into technology, but you're, you're not a critic of the boom. Absolutely You're saying not. just be smart about what's really uh, what could possibly happen and what policies are enacted. Right, so I think two things are essential. One is we need to be smart and serious about what's actually happening. I don't want people to say, let's not worry about getting our jobs policy right and our growth policy right and our foreign policy right because this is going to make us independent of the Middle East and solve our jobs and economic problems. I think in a time where we do have so many problems, it's really tempting to say, let's check a couple of these off the list. And I don't want to do that if they can't genuinely be checked off the list. And the other thing, and we haven't, we haven't talked about this and we can uh, later on, is that there are big environmental challenges associated with these, particularly in, in the areas where development happens. Uh, and not only the traditional ones like air and water, but the challenge of integrating this activity into communities. Uh, I talk a lot about that. I visited with a lot of people uh, who are grappling with that challenge from all sides of it. And we have to get that right, not only because it's the fair thing to do, but because if you don't get it right, uh, all of these jobs impacts and other impacts, however large or small they are, uh, could be foregone uh, if there's a serious backlash and these developments can go forward. All right, so, the, so here, uh, let me inter interject a question. There's something that I've wondered. The last sentence, we know that, that if a Macondo happens in a fracking field, this could have very serious repercussions in terms of the companies being able to proceed with this boom. Uh, do the companies themselves take that seriously uh, in, 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 in terms of you know, proactively getting out there and making sure it's done right? There's enormous variation among the different companies. I think some of them are out there trying to make sure it's done right, but uh, the onshore oil industry, in particular the sort of hydraulic fracturing, tight oil, shale gas world, is much more uh, diverse even than offshore drilling. And so I think some companies probably believe that as long as they keep a good reputation, they'll be insulated from problems that others uh, incur. I don't think that's right. I don't think people distinguish carefully among the different companies. We're starting to see some progress in a good direction, uh, particularly at the state level. We're seeing some uh, private initiatives aimed at trying to boost confidence in development, uh, an impressive uh, looking effort that combines Environmental Defense Fund with uh, a couple big oil companies and some universities trying to certify companies for good practices in Pennsylvania. So we're seeing developments. Part of what I worry is that even if a handful of big companies went to their typical friends in Congress and said, look, I'm afraid that something will go wrong and some of my competitors will cut corners, do something stupid, and ruin this for, all, ruin this for me, their friends in Congress would say, I still don't want to put additional smart regulation on the industry. I think we've got a really weird situation there where everyone would benefit from making sure that the whole effort can't be undermined by someone doing something stupid. Uh, but the prospects of actually getting uh, people in Washington beyond the regulators using their existing tools to do things are pretty limited. But isn't it inevitable that there's going to be a big accident? I mean, this, it, it happens, right? Now Accidents or five happen, years? Yes. Yeah. Well, and we've seen accidents. I, I don't know how inevitable it is that there's something on the scale of the Deepwater Horizon disaster. Yeah. It, that's a peculiar circumstance, and the, you know, the details onshore are very different from offshore. But I think there's a good chance that we have something go badly wrong. And then the question becomes, how does that more broadly influence development? It's a bit trickier than, than offshore. I think the dynamics are different. Uh, this is so spread out throughout the country and affects so many different people that there's going to be a big uh, there's a lot of pressure to keep it going. But yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a real risk. I, don't, I, I never like to say that anything is inevitable, but the risk is high enough that we should be doing something about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, technology. All right, so you, you have this line. Well, for, first let me introduce that, that we've gone through a boom period in, te in clean tech, yeah. right? Uh, for the last five or so years, clean tech was the hottest. You, you yourself uh, lay this out the hottest investment in 
Silicon Valley. All the VCs wanted to get their piece of you know biofuels or batteries, what oh, whatever. There's been a there's been a waking up. Regulators are beholden to the progress of technology. So we think of regulation as something that drives technological change, and at some level it can drive adoption of new technologies. But regulators can't push hard if there isn't a clear way to satisfy their demands. The auto industry is a great example. A big part of the reason why we've been able to see new fuel economy standards that will continue to push uh, forward on fuel economy over the next decade is because technological change has made it possible to actually fulfill those mandates. So when the EPA and the Department of Transportation go and estimate the cost of complying with these regulations, it's not astronomical. Uh, why? Because we've seen big gains in materials, in, in uh, the way that cars operate, so in a lot of ways computing. Uh, we've seen uh, the advance of hybrids that allow us to foresee much bigger penetration into the market. Uh, but the other piece of the story is that we don't have all the technology yet that is going to allow us to comply with the various requirements that we've set out. So when, we, uh, when people talk about our future trajectory, they'll often say, well, our fuel economy rules say that we're going to have uh, cars that get 54.5 miles per gallon measured in a strange way by 2025. If you go and talk to the car companies, and I did this when I was working on the book, they'll say, look, we know how we're going to get to around 2022 and comply with these mandates. We're not so sure about the last three years of this. And by the way, that's why we insisted when we negotiated this that there be a review in, in 2018 to determine whether the regulations need to be tweaked. If we don't have the right progress on technology, if we don't have the right progress on costs, I assume that when we get to, 20, to 2018, there will be a big push to change the rules. And if we have made a lot of progress, uh, then I think the companies will still buy in. Uh, at this point, uh, you know, if you go back 40 years, uh, pushing for more uh, fuel efficient cars was really about selling smaller cars instead of bigger cars. If you're a car company, you don't want to sell a smaller, cheaper car instead of a bigger, better car because you're not going to make as much money on it. To the extent that it's technology rather than size that's allowing you to be more fuel efficient, this is actually an opportunity for a lot of automakers. They're basically selling technology instead of gasoline. So they can take market in, in a very broad sense away from the fuel producers. Uh, if you're in that world, you have a very different interaction and a very different opportunity. So on, on cars, on electric cars, one, one of the big um, uh, advances that's been expected in these years and a big investment that the Obama administration made and really the Bush administration and the Clinton administration was in the development of electric cars, batteries, we haven't quite gotten there. And you say that, that uh, the, the most uh, prospective improvements in fuel efficiencies are going to hap happen, are happening and will happen in gasoline propulsion. So I'm, I'm waiting for, for your book to really learn about batteries. Uh, but a lot of the big improvements, you're absolutely right, a lot of the big improvements are in doing conventional cars better. We're still moving forward on uh, from hybrids to plug-in hybrids to fully electric at some point in the future. But a lot of the big gains are in conventional cars. I live in New York City, so I don't drive a lot. Uh, I, so I may be a bit naive on what improvements have happened in cars. And I, I talk in the book about visiting the Ford uh, the Ford test facility. I was supposed to drive this peppy little uh, Ford Focus Electric. Uh, I saw this Mustang out of the corner of my eye and I said, I'd really rather drive that. It looks like a lot more fun. They wouldn't let me. A few weeks later, I was off doing research for the book. I got to a car rental station at the airport. They said, we'd like to replace your tiny little car that you've reserved with a Mustang. And I said, you've got to be kidding me. My, my you know, work will fire me if I spend $2,000 on gasoline over the next uh, week of driving around the state of Colorado. And then I went to my smartphone and looked, at, uh, looked up uh, the fuel economy of a Mustang, and it was 31 miles a gallon. I was shocked. Uh, now, maybe I shouldn't have been shocked. Maybe had I been driving a real car for the last 10 years, I would have learned something different. But what's happened is you have turbocharging, which actually improves fuel economy if you use it the right way. You have better materials. Uh, you have design that allows you to improve the fuel economy of cars. You have all sorts of esoteric technologies to do fuel injection in different ways. All sorts of little bits that add up to large changes 
in the fuel economy of our cars and trucks. And on top of that, since gasoline is expensive, people are much more interested in actually buying these things. All right. So we have, uh, so, so, so far we have a boom in oil and gas in the United States and around the world. On what level and what, what scale, we have yet to see. We do not have what we thought was going to happen in clean tech, and, 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 and let's see where that goes. Wither climate change. Well, this is a huge issue overlaying everything we talk about. And I should say, we've had a pretty significant flow of money into clean tech. If you look in 2011, as almost as much money uh, went into clean tech investment as went into uh, exploration and production of oil and gas in the United States. So these are big numbers. This has become a big business. It's not up to the scale of the climate challenge at this point, uh, but we're seeing falling costs and new opportunities. Uh, one of the ironies of falling costs is it actually makes it more cost effective to try and push things to the next level. Uh, you can't subsidize or provide government support for something that's extraordinarily expensive at a large scale, but if the costs are close enough, you have new opportunities. Uh, climate change. We've gotten to an odd debate about climate change, where we focus, uh, we, if you go back five years, we actually had a co somewhat coherent debate about climate. We had two presidential candidates fighting over whose cap and trade system was better, and about who was going to provide a larger boost to clean energy industries. Um, today, we have a very polarized climate debate, and we've, in a big way, started shifting to fighting not about what will actually solve our climate problem, but about whether oil and gas development is ba so bad for climate change that we should not either allow it to go forward or encourage it to go forward. And I think we're in a, quite a bit of a muddle there. So let's start with oil. Uh, more US oil production mostly displaces oil from the rest of the world, not just in the US market, but in the global market. And that means that its impact on emissions is relatively small. Uh, more natural gas production right now is mostly displacing coal-fired power. And that means that emissions come down as a result, uh, even though natural gas entails greenhouse gas emissions. So we've got oil where we're making economic gains without much of a climate penalty in the United States. And we've got natural gas that's actually helping us on climate. My big fear in all of this is not that oil and gas will be disasters for the climate change, but that we're going to get distracted from taking the other steps we need in order to solve the problem. Uh, take a look first at natural gas replacing coal. We had last year all these headlines about how natural gas use had reached uh, uh, such high levels that emissions had dropped to, I believe, 1994 uh, yeah. levels. If you look at the new Department of Energy projections for natural gas use, they don't see gas use returning to last year's levels until 2026. So last year was an anomaly. Prices were really low. They're more normal now, and that means coal gets to claw back. So we need to use gas as an opportunity to push forward with policy that reduces emissions more cheaply than we could have several years ago, rather than hoping this will solve our problems for us. On the oil front, we need to make sure that abundant oil doesn't distract us from the need to cut our oil consumption. And we can do both of those at the same time. Cutting our oil consumption is a much more powerful way to confront climate change. Uh, and as natural gas gains this foothold, we need to also make sure that we are encouraging the development of alternative energy technologies whether it's renewable energy, nuclear power, carbon capture and sequestration, I, have, I don't have enough confidence uh, in my ability to predict the future to say, well, we should pick one and dive in. I think we need to uh, create opportunities for all of, these, uh, all of these to improve. And that's partly the sort of standard talk about R&D. It's partly getting the stuff out in the field. Some of the most exciting innovations in clean energy have to do with business models. Uh, you don't normally think when you talk innovation about lawyers doing their job better or bankers doing their job better. You usually think about a guy in the lab. But whether it's finding the right contracts to let people put solar panels on someone's roof and have an alternative way to finance that, or uh, new schemes for financing sales of cars that require a lot less fuel, uh, I think a lot of the innovations are there and you've got to get things out in the field in order to make that happen. So we need to make sure that this, uh, the, the, that particularly in the power world, natural gas doesn't crowd that out. Um, let's go on to geopolitics. All right. All right. Um, all right. We already introduced this. Uh, the U.S. Come, comes into the equation. Everything else has to remain uh, uh, equal, but we have a lot of moving parts. OPEC supply. India and China demand we didn't, we didn't mention. And that's the big wild card in a lot of this, particularly China. If Chinese demand continues to accelerate, 
then there's a lot of room for everyone in the world market. You can have high prices and continued uh, growth in U.S. production, decline in U.S. consumption, and it still all adds up. That's roughly the world of the 1970s, where you had, uh, or at least the early 70s, late 60s, where you had big gains in demand around the world that basically let everyone pour supply in. If you got to a point where Chinese demand came in a lot lower than people expect, uh, then, uh, and you combined it with some of these big supply gains, then you could turn things around. Then you could get a bit closer to the 1980s world, where you have this surge in production at the same time as stagnant demand, prices crash, and there's a lot of fallout around the world from that. You talk about geopolitics. Our conversation here is mostly about the, the geopolitics of American energy independence. But a lot of what will happen as a result of the developments here, uh, it will be about impacts on, in other parts of the world. So uh, I painted this picture where I said, well, we can increase production because others will hold back a bit on theirs and let the market balance up to a point. Well, for them, holding back on their production means taking in less in the way of revenues. Right? So that is consequential for the countries that decide to do that. If you have a temporary crash in prices, that is very consequential for producers. It's also pretty important for consumers, uh, some of whom are in the same region as the producers. So Jordan, Egypt, they would benefit from lower prices, even if for a period of time, uh, give them a little breathing room uh, instead of having to negotiate deals with IMF and remove subsidies and invite popular unrest. Uh, on the natural gas front, uh, even the threat of US supplies coming into the market makes it tougher for some of these countries in East Africa, Mozambique, Tanzania, that are trying to produce relatively high cost gas and put it on the market uh, to develop it. Uh, so there are all sorts of geopolitical consequences that are not directly about us. And it's important to keep those in mind. So uh, why don't we talk about, uh, I mean, we can separate, but let's t um, talk about China, if you don't mind. So the confluence of all of these trends, plus China's own internal politics, are creating a, a, a certain um, laboratory you know, in, in which things can ha happen. What do, you, uh, what do you expect there? What do you th uh, how do you add all that up? So China provides a lot of government support to a variety of strategic technology industries. And so they've been trying to get electric cars off the ground in a big way. They've been trying to build a strong wind industry. They've subsidized solar in a way that has helped solar installers a lot here, but hurt a lot of uh, solar developers that are trying to put in place new technologies. I think we'll get some interesting developments out of China. It's just on such a big scale and so much variety. Uh, from place to place that we'll see, we'll see some big things happen. I don't know which those will be. Uh, the other big question mark is will China develop its shale gas resources in the way that the United States has? And I, my guess is that eventually if the geology is right, and I think that's a big question mark because we don't really know, uh, then they will. Uh, but with an emphasis on the word eventually. Uh, the United States has a host of circumstances that have made the boom here more feasible. Uh, we have private land rights that allow uh, a lot of things to happen without government stepping in. We have uh, deep and liquid futures markets for natural gas that allow companies to sell their gas forward and raise money to invest. We have an open pipeline system that allows independent developers to produce gas and then put it in there. We have a robust service industry that, again, adds to flexibility and so on and so on. We have uh, resources that are close enough to cities that you can get water to them easily but not so far from cities that it costs a fortune to, uh, close enough to cities you can get water in, not so close that the environmental challenges are insurmountable. I think in a lot of the world, these pieces won't necessarily add up. In Europe, the population is so dense that the environmental problems will be very difficult. Um, on top of that, again, in Europe, you don't have this liquid financial market that will allow you to sell forward and fund development. In China, you have remote deposits, so water is a challenge, and infrastructure to get this stuff out is a challenge. But I see two big differences. First, there isn't this ambiguity between public and private. Uh, the Chinese government has the ability to do a lot more coordination than you can in most of the world. So we, we have something closer to a pure private system. They have something closer, but not quite a pure public system. Uh, that at least provides some coherence. China also has an alternative way to finance these sorts of developments, other than through selling, uh, selling production forward they have state financing. So I think they have a couple pieces that make it easier for this to happen than Europe. Uh, but still, uh, quite a bit of time before I think we see something big there. Right. So we, sticking on China, we, we have a flashpoint out there uh, in, in the East and South China Seas between Japan and the Philippines and China. 
We have uh, those countries asking for U.S. naval support. There's friction between the United States and China. Who, who's going to control those lanes and further out into the Pacific and then going on uh, this direction in the Indian Ocean, Persian Gulf? One of the perceptions of the U.S. boom going forward, the U.S. no longer has a, uh, a geostrategic interest in controlling, in securing these seas. Um, you have a different view. Well, I think we've heard this from senior figures in the administration recently, and I'm happy that they've been emphasizing it, that the United States still does have this big stake in what happens in sea lanes around the world and in producing regions around the world. First, uh, whatever people's projections are for 2020 or 2025 or 2030, we're not in 2020 or 2025 or 2030. We're in a world where we do depend on physically and directly on imports from elsewhere. Uh, but on top of that, it's really difficult to separate yourself from these global market dynamics. Let's imagine for a moment that North America produced all the oil that it consumed. And, there was, and so all Middle Eastern oil was flowing east to Asia. And there was a disruption in the Straits of Hormuz or something happened in Saudi Arabia. What would our friends, our allies, others in Asia do given that shortage of oil? They would go around the world and try to bid it away. They would spend money to bring oil in and that would raise our oil prices. Okay? If they took oil from Canada, for example, or if they tried to bid oil from the United States, that would raise our prices. So it's very difficult to isolate yourself. Uh, on top of that, if the United States were to pull back, it would be a really fundamental uh, decision in terms of US relations with allies in Asia and the Middle East. We'd basically be saying to Japan, Korea, we're done with you. You do your own thing. Sort it all out with China. We'll be sitting over here and uh, you know, hope it turns out OK. I don't see us heading down that, that road in a deliberate way. What I would say, though, is that regardless of what the underlying logic is, the politics could push us at least to some degree in that direction. Uh, political decisions aren't made based on what your economics advisor tells you. They're made based on what you think is going to happen in the world. And if we look throughout history, uh, leaders believe that their physical dependence on oil supplies is hugely consequential, and they make decisions based on that. So as we have a debate on how much we should pivot or rebalance or whatever we're calling it these days to Asia, this will enter into that. We're not going to create a new debate over uh, the balance of US forces, but this will enter into it. And a lot of people will believe that this weighs on the side of shifting more toward Asia and less uh, to the Middle East. Uh, in China, there's a lot of discussion and a lot of confusion about whether the United States will shift its posture. And regardless of what we say, they are not going to fully believe us. And they will take steps to hedge. Same thing in the Middle East. You travel to the Middle East, and this is certainly not universal, but there are a lot of people in the Middle East who genuinely believe that the United States is there to take the oil. And if you believe that, and then you see the United States no longer needing to take the oil, you act differently. You find new partners, you find new people to support you. Again, I think these are slow burn things, in part because there's no other country with the will and the capacity to replace the United States in these security responsibilities. Uh, China, you might be able to talk about China doing it on paper, but we're not anywhere close in terms of aircraft carrier capacity and other abilities to operate uh, far away. But I do think it's important for the United States to continue to emphasize that it is committed to having this role. Uh, it's not to say that it always does it well. But there is no ready replacement, and certainly not one that we would like, for the United States in these regions and providing for open commerce, uh, including in oil and other natural resources around the world. All right. Perceptions are important. Let's open this up. Let's get uh, questions. Um, please wait for the mic and um, identify yourself. We have one question up here. Um, if the uh, oil that we would produce in the United States trades on the global market, um, why does that truly increase security here? Wouldn't it actually decrease security if there are significant environmental uh, impacts of it? We are actually distributing our oil at an environmental cost to us, especially in terms of water, um, if fracking uh, is, a, is a key factor in the national, natural gas element of it. So that's a good question. 
First, I don't want to suggest that there are no security benefits from producing our own oil. Uh, we would still be more resilient to price shocks. I don't, like I said, I don't think we would be fully protected from them, but we would be more resilient. In a very extreme case that I think is unlikely, we could, if we were totally uh, self-sufficient, cut off exports and use that to insulate ourselves. Again, I don't think that's particularly likely. Uh, the environmental consequences you talk about we need to, I think, think about uh, first as climate and then as local uh, environmental impacts. So on the climate part, uh, the, US, the, the US contribution is on the margin. And so it's useful to think of it in terms of costs and benefits. And you can quantify the costs. Uh, you can say, let's say that a ton of carbon uh, put in the atmosphere does $20 worth of damage, which is what the US government says. You can say, let's imagine it causes $100 worth of damage just to be safe and compare that to the economic benefits that come from adding this to the market. And given current oil prices, it's very tough to come to the conclusion that the environmental damages there outweigh the economic gains. And, uh, and we can talk about that in, in detail later. I don't want to do math in front of a large crowd. Um, it's never a good thing to do. Uh, on the local environmental side, I think there's a lot of stuff we do need to do. We need to deal with water properly. There's uh, a good story, I think it was in courts this morning, about. Uh, from one of your colleagues uh, looking at the water impacts region by region in the United States. We may have enough water as a country to supply this, but there often are infrastructure bottlenecks and so on. I don't think of that as a security issue. I don't think that uh, water distribution in Colorado is a national security issue. That doesn't mean that it's not important, but I don't know that you can put those two together and say, well, here's how we weigh the security balance. Okay. Next. Um, hi, I'm Chris Leonard. I'm a Schwartz fellow here. I was I would love to hear your thoughts about this notion that um, the growing domestic supplies could create sort of an industrial renaissance in the U.S. It'll be cheaper for manufacturers to to do things here, and also petrochemical manufacturers might have an edge. So, let's separate this into three categories: petrochemicals, energy-intensive manufacturing, and other manufacturing. So, start from start from the third. Most manufacturing does not require a lot of energy inputs. And so cheaper energy does not make a decisive difference. Energy intensive manufacturing, steel, cement, glass, let's set aside petrochemicals for the moment, does depend more on energy costs. But there's still a relatively small piece of the equation. I find it unlikely that uh, radically lower natural gas prices will cause a lot more investment in those areas in the United States. I do think it will deter some plant closures. Right? Once you've already put in all the capital for a plant, then this energy cost difference looms much larger in your decision making. And so you're likely to keep things open for longer. I also think the other big impact uh, on that kind of manufacturing is from the supply chain for oil and gas production. We tend to conflate these pieces, but about 20% of the capital that goes into a shale gas well is steel. That's an energy intensive uh, manufactured product. About 10% is cement, another energy intensive manufactured product. Demand for that is certainly bolstered by oil and gas production, but it's not because natural gas is cheap, it's because people need, it, need this to put in it uh, to, to build the wells. And I think that the, the simultaneous discussions about that impact and the low prices are confusing things a bit. What we're seeing is mostly an impact um, of greater demand for these products because of the industry. Petrochemicals is a special case because you're not only using methane or natural gas liquids that, well, you're not only using methane, natural gas, to power the plants, you're actually using it to make the product. Uh, you're using methane to make the product, and you're using something called natural gas liquids, which is somewhere between gas and oil. It comes up with natural gas uh, in order to feed into big facilities and produce uh, ethylene that allows you to make a whole host of uh, different products. I think there, there is a much bigger uh, set of gains to be had. One of the questions, uh, one of the variables we'll still face is whether some of those natural gas liquids are exported. And we have this whole discussion about uh, liquefied natural gas exports, and there's a lot of attention on that and a lot of concern about the manufacturing impact. I think it might be at least as consequential for manufacturing whether people start to liquefy and ship ethane to other parts of the world. And there's certainly folks looking at that. Uh. Michael, if I might ask about, about uh, one of the big consequences we hear and one of the great, uh, biggest components of the rhetoric is OPEC, getting off oil, getting off Saudi Arabian oil, and, and there's uh, uh, a lot of xenophobia that's all, yeah, it's all, all wrapped up into that. Um, 
What happens to OPEC? The, these countries, their economies, the longevity of the leaders of those countries rely on that oil. What do all of these trends me mean for them? Can they really cut back? In so I think that as long as these countries need to cut back only in the sense of not growing their production as much as they might have, they're generally fine. Um, so if you sit still with whatever you're producing and you are able to keep a lid on prices, then you're basically okay. If you have to actually cut back your production, not just in a, in a relative sense, relative to what you were hoping to do, but in an absolute sense, I think it politically becomes more difficult. You're actually shrinking revenues and causing yourself to make tough political choices. I don't think the United States alone is going to push the world to that kind of decision, but if you combine the United States with Canada, maybe with Iraq, which is its own OPEC story because it's part of it, um, and maybe with a change in Chinese demand, then you start to get some of these tough decisions. But I think you need to put a lot of those pieces together. The other thing I'd say is that if the sort of, you know, there's a, the theory out there that if OPEC didn't constrain supplies, we would have oil that was $20 a barrel because they have all this in the ground and it costs next to nothing to produce. If that were true and we were to defeat OPEC, we would not have all this big US oil production. Right? If defeating OPEC means $20 oil, that also means a crash in US oil production. So you have to have a self-consistent story, at least over the long run. The oil industry can sustain a lot of internal contradictions for a year or two, but over the long run, uh, it's very tough to, uh, to really uh, bring down prices in a big way, which is what defeating OPEC would be about, uh, if what you're using to do it is high-priced oil. But that is the narrative, the narrative big abund age of abundance, oil prices crash, and it's come by up for the United States. I think that that is a wrong way to look at the world. Again, low oil prices would be good for the United States, but it would not sustain this US oil production. It would have to come from some kind of other source. And one thing that we ought to be thinking ahead about is the economic impact of volatility in the oil and gas industry. This is not a stable industry. Again, we've got a good news story right now, but this is an industry with a big history of ups and downs. We talk a lot about multiplier effects in oil and gas. So people talk about how many jobs are created. You, you put out all those numbers at the beginning, and a lot of that is because people say, well, for every job in the industry, there are so many jobs upstream, there are so many jobs induced, and so on. Those multiplier effects work on the way down also. And so if you had a big crash and you had a significant contraction in the industry, you would see ripple effects downward. And I think we need to be thinking ahead about that. Uh, people in Texas have thought about that for a long time. People in North Dakota who are going through this boom right now have been through busts before. And to imagine that we've eliminated booms and busts in the oil market uh, might turn out to be just as good of a, of a prediction belief as the belief a decade ago that we had eliminated booms and busts in the business cycle. Okay. Uh, we have a, a question all the way in the back. Uh, Andrew Holland with the American Security Project. Michael, you and I have uh, had a, a couple of debates of, over Twitter about this. Uh, and I guess it, I kind of contend that demand in the developing world, China, developing Asia, Africa, is essentially unlimited at 80 to 90 dollars a barrel of oil. Uh, so I don't see a collapse in prices. Uh, I kind of I want you to unpack it a little bit more why you think that there could be a collapse in prices due to China or you so know. I'm not, I'm not saying that it's likely that there will be a collapse in prices. I think you can certainly foresee circumstances where it will happen. Uh, and again you don't need to have wild ideas about this. If you look at uh, again, the International Energy Agency projections, if they are remotely close to true, you open up a big gap between capacity to produce and demand for oil in the next several years. And that has to resolve itself somehow. Either that is because that gets resolved because some countries decide to invest less in production and grow it less and preempt this kind of problem for prices. Or prices fall for a bit and wipe out some of the incremental supply, including in the United States. Uh, so I don't think it's implausible over the next few years. I think over the longer run, you either have this continually growing production that you're talking about, or you have a big change in the world where uh, countries decide to curb their consumption substantially, and then I do think you get into a very different picture. 
I hate projecting what will happen in the world 10, 20, 30 years from now. It's a great way to make yourself look like a fool. Um, and I know that in some circles when you say, I don't know what will happen, uh, that counts as saying, I don't understand what's going on. Uh, but in this case, that's really what we should be saying if we understand the problem correctly. Because the dynamics internally in a country like China uh, that combine you know, different functioning of market, different policies, uh, urbanization, different consumer preferences, you can't project that well 10 or 20 years out into the future. Uh, right here. Uh, hi, Marsha Johnston, um, Earth Steward Associates. Um, I just, uh, I'm a little confused whether we're talking about demand reduction being the trend or whether we're talking about, you know, uh, big increases in demand from developing countries. Can somebody clarify a little bit? This seems so like we're talking about demand reduction in the United States, but if trends are any indication we're seeing still large demand increases from elsewhere in the world. Uh, the United States is heading in a different direction. We've had oil consumption fall not perfectly steadily, but pretty steadily since about 2005. This is the first sustained trend like this uh, since the 1970s. At the same time, we're seeing large supply, sorry, large demand increases elsewhere in the world, and that's what allows these different pieces to, uh, to add up. Now, again, to be clear, I would prefer that the world got its act together and started consuming less oil or at least increasing its demand for oil uh, in uh, a more modest way. But the United States has pretty limited control over what happens in these other countries, or lim limited influence. I don't think it has any control in a meaningful sense. Right here. This man. <laughs> Hi, Stephen Lacey with Green Tech Media. Um, I'm curious, as you traveled around the country, how extensively you found the oil and gas boom has impacted clean tech. Uh, certainly, the industry has gone through a number of challenges, many of those um, independent of the oil and gas boom, particularly in manufacturing and electric vehicles and solar, um, but energy production continues to grow. Um, how intertwined are these two in the U.S.? It's a great question. Um, one of my favorite experiences while I was writing the book was visiting with the CEO of a, a company that makes batteries for electric cars in Silicon Valley, and he bragged to me about how cheap his natural gas fueled vehicle was and how he'd gotten a great deal and was saving all this money but he still did not think that it could expand and take over his market and so he was still going just as hard on batteries for electric cars and wasn't having problems with getting the financing. I think there's obviously an impact particularly from the gas side and the oil side is again the price impacts are much more moderate we're in a big global market there are offsetting uh, factors that make it hard for US supply to move prices all that much. Uh, natural gas is more challenging. Uh, it, puts a cap on, uh, you know, it, it reduces peak prices, and so that creates challenges for uh, technologies like solar that are supposed to make their money delivering cheap energy around peak times. But I still think the bigger factor is policy here. Uh, if you look at what's happening, and if, if you look at various modeling efforts, and all these should be taken with a grain of salt, you look at the counterfactuals and say, what would happen if we took away uh, cheap natural gas? You see much larger gains in coal and you see still limited gains in clean energy technology. If you ask what happens if we reduce the capital costs of clean energy by 20 or 30 percent, you can do that by changing the technology or by putting in place different policy, you see much larger changes in renewable generation. So for the time being, I think the main impact in terms of sort of straight economics uh, is from policy rather than from the market itself. Over the longer run, I think that could change as uh, the costs for uh, renewable energy te technology come down uh, and get closer to where natural gas would have been without this abundance, and by the way, where coal would have been, because that's the other competitor that gas is sort of obscuring, then that becomes more complicated. And it's part of why, if we want to really get to zero carbon energy, we still need policy. Uh, that's not news. That was true before there was a boom in natural gas. It's still true. Uh, but that definitely has to be uh, a big part of the equation. The other thing I would say, and this goes beyond the sort of basic economics and even the policy decisions, is there is, I'm sure, an impact on people's mentalities. Right? So when you go out and you're a venture capitalist, you've got your own host of problems. I think we found that the venture capital model isn't fantastic for funding a lot of clean technology solutions that we want. But when you take that and then you combine it with the stigma that, that followed Solyndra for right or wrong, there's real stigma when you want to go raise capital, and then you add on this natural gas story that people aren't quite sure what to make of, it can't help you raise money for these funds. I think that's 
I think it would be foolish to claim that it, that it uh, has no impact. Uh, what happens to nuclear? Well, nuclear is cost challenged, let's say. If you go back five years, nuclear was cost challenged. Nuclear was not a competitive way to generate US electricity before natural gas got cheap. It's suffering from some additional challenges of the margin from a combination of cheap gas, which stops it from making as much money as people would like during the day, and wind subsidies, which stop it from making as much money as people would like at night. Um, so when some of these small, older plants come up for safety upgrades, it turns out to be cheaper to shut the thing down, replace it with a gas plant, than to uh, pay for the upgrade and continue to operate it. But I think that's a small impact. We'll see a bigger impact when we get uh, relicensing decisions down the road. Uh, but before the gas boom and after the gas boom, the big variable for nuclear was still a price on carbon. If you let nuclear capture the value of the fact that it does not entail greenhouse, meaningful greenhouse gas emissions, you're going to get a lot more nuclear power generation. It's that, it's that simple. Now we would at that point have to face challenges like waste disposal and safety and all these things. We will have plenty of debates. Um, and it might be that at that point, renewable energy was a better economic bet. Or carbon capture and sequestration turns out to be a better economic bet. But we won't find out absent a serious carbon policy because nuclear just won't be able to compete. It couldn't compete with, with coal, even with scrubbers and good efforts to deal with particulate emissions and so on. And it can't compete with cheap natural gas right now in this country. Uh, the rest of the world is a different story. But right. in this country, uh, nuclear has a, a very large uphill fight. Okay. This man has been very patient. <laughs> Michael Swoboda, Yale Forum on Climate Change in the Media. I uh, just wanted to ask about two things we haven't heard about, uh, Canada, tar sands, Keystone, and the German energy vendor. So Canada, tar sands, Keystone. To me, this is a, a, this is a great example of how we focus on a symbolic fight instead of getting down to the guts of what we need to do. Uh, I wrote a study on uh, Canadian oil sands four or five years ago, my colleagues used to make fun of me and, and ask why I was working on an issue that no one cared about. Um, and then all of a sudden, this came out of nowhere uh, as, some, as a huge focus in American energy debates. I mean, the, re the bottom line reality is that Keystone would not have a large impact on American energy security, on the American economy, or on climate change. I mean, you can just do the numbers and it doesn't have a big impact. The only way to imagine that it would have a very big impact on climate is to say Keystone is really a proxy for massive expansion of Canadian oil sands. And all of that expansion would be additional to the world market, not substituting for anything else. If you believe all those things, you also have to believe that Keystone would lower oil prices enormously. Because that same set of assumptions would drive you to make that conclusion. So you can't sort of escape this. You can't say it's huge for climate change and nothing for the economy, or it's huge for the economy and nothing for climate change. The two go together. Uh, but it's a small issue. I understand that it's galvanizing. I understand that it's important to, for people to focus on something. But here you have an issue that 70% of the American people say they would like to see Keystone go ahead. And I think the president would have real political challenges if he said no to it. He's trying to promote an approach that says we're going to push forward on oil and gas production. And I'm going, you know, we're going to use, for now, existing regulatory authority to really screw down on emissions on the demand side. Um, I think he'd have a harder time selling that as a, as a coherent approach if he, said no, uh, if he said no to the pipeline. I also find it slightly peculiar that we're spending so much time debating Canadian energy policy when we have some very large problems in this, uh, in this country. But uh, you know, that's, this is the fight we're having. I wish we were at least using it as an opportunity for people to get smarter about energy, about energy security, about climate change. I don't think we're using it as an opportunity to get smarter, to say the least. Uh, the, the other question was about what's happening in Germany. I'm not an expert on Germany. I'm not going to pretend to be one. Uh, you know, the German experience tell, tells us, first, that if you want to put in the policy muscle, you can get a deployment of a lot of different technologies. Uh, but it's also providing us with a learning experience on what happens when you push a lot of intermittent technologies uh, into the system. And so there's a lot of backlash in Germany against, what's, uh, against some of this from the industrial world. Uh, there are challenges with grid integration. Again. Maybe it's good for the United States to have Germany go through this. We can learn some lessons. We should pay some attention. We, we love to talk about how we'll export 
uh, the American experience on uh, natural gas to the rest of the world or the Amer exper American experience on innovation to the rest of the world. Uh, here's a case where we should be really paying attention to Europe and learning uh, from them. Again, whether it's grid integration or how to do setbacks for uh, renewable energy projects so that people actually uh, are open to having them built near their homes. And there's a lot of lessons uh, to be learned from what's happening over there. I'd, I'd also add one small, small thing. In any Germany comparison, you have to be very careful to take into, and frankly, a lot of European comparisons, you have to be careful to take into account the fact that these countries can import uh, electricity at large scale in order to balance their system. And that's an important piece. So uh, it's more practical to think about Germany as an analog, let's say, to New York State or to Colorado than it is to think of it as an analog to the United States as a whole. Okay. Yes, sir. Right here. Um, wait, wait. <laughs> I'm Jack Riggs with the Aspen Institute. Um, I want to go back to two of your answers and, and follow up a little bit. One, just recently you mentioned the potential political difficulty of a Keystone decision. Do you think it would be feasible for President Obama to announce, uh, to allow the Keystone permit if he did it at about the same time that he issued a strong uh, carbon rule for existing power plants? And second, I want to go back to your um, comments about oil demand. Since transportation is such a key part of oil demand, and I want to ask you to make a projection because you say you don't want to do that, but how should we think about the potential for alternative fuels to displace large amounts of oil, whether it's electricity or gas? Great questions. So feasible, totally feasible. Uh, I mean, the only challenge to the detailed scenario you paint is that it, a keystone decision might have to come in the not so distant future and figuring out how to really do the EPA regulations right is going to take time. This is not just a matter of taking a study off the shelf and implementing it. To really get some solid, ambitious regulations, you need to come up with some clever ways to make them flexible within existing regulatory authority. And that's not actually easy. So that's going to take some time. But you can send a strong signal. If you mean politically feasible, well, the president can do what he wants to do. Uh, will it satisfy his, uh, his critics who have focused on the Keystone Pipeline? I doubt it. I think the Keystone Pipeline has been set out as a litmus test. Uh, I would also say, by the way, there's become this discussion about how the president might do this as a trade for the Keystone Pipeline. All indications I have is that this administration wanted to do power plant regulations in the first place. So it's not like it would be a new trade. To the extent that there is a trade, I think it's a much more ambiguous, soft one. It's that if the administration said no on Keystone, I think it would create an atmosphere where people were more suspicious of these kinds of regulations. And I don't think it would prompt Congress to take away his authority, but I think it would make it easier for them to do it if they wanted to. It would be much easier for people to tell the story about how the president is using his regulatory authority to do things that we don't think he should be doing, and therefore we should claw back that regulatory authority a bit. So I think I would like to see, uh, I would like to see stronger regulations on existing power plants. I want to make sure they're done right. I don't, want, I don't think we want to see them thrown back the way the new power plant regulations were. So people are going to need to take time to figure out how to get this right. It's complicated territory because it's not traditional use of uh, EPA regulations. It's not a, a widget that you have to add to your plant. It's essentially a system change you're trying to promote. And it's tricky to feed that into the uh, existing laws. And that, that gets to a broader point, by the, by the way. And we t started the discussion talking about the 1970s. We're still we're still sort of using the vestiges of the legal authority that was built up over decades to deal with very different problems from some of our biggest environmental challenges, including climate change. Um, and even the Keystone fight is trying to take rules that were set up to do something very different decades ago and use them to tackle climate change. They're just not effective in tackling climate change. And so ultimately, you do need to be able to, as, as impossible as it may seem right now in Washington, you do need at some point to be able to pass legislation to get on top of these challenges. There is no way around it. You can do things now with existing authority, but ultimately you do need a broad approach that a wide spectrum of people can buy into. There, there is no way around that in the long run. Uh, you asked this separate question about how do we tackle, uh, how do we tackle demand for, uh, for oil in the United States. Globally. I'm going to talk about the United States because I'm a, I'm globally let a thousand flowers bloom and each country is independent. I don't think, you know, it has their own way of doing things. I think in the United States, 
We're working through fuel economy regulations enabled by better technology. I personally would love to see in the context of a serious deal on the deficit, the use of a stronger uh, gasoline tax instead of hiking taxes on income or uh, on personal or corporate income. I don't know that that's all that likely. Uh, but I think that if you do the modeling, and I've, I've done modeling with at least one model with a colleague where you compare a deficit package that uses a gas tax to raise money with one that uses personal income and corporate taxes to raise money. And uh, if you do it the right way, you get better economic performance, better job growth, and lower oil consumption. But I'm not going to bank on, on them, the, and the details matter there. Um, so that, that's sort of the regulatory piece. You can also then ask us sort of a, the technology level what's going to deliver. And I think over the near term, it's mostly changes in our cars and trucks. It's also changes in people's patterns of where they live and uh, where they choose to work and how much they drive. I think people are changing with high oil prices. And we're pretty far out of sample as economists uh, say when we try to extrapolate from the past to the present. So I think it'll be interesting to see how that develops. Uh, two, other, two or three other categories people tend to look at, uh, biofuels. Uh, I love, read, I love reading these modeling efforts that assume that every piece of the biofuels mandate will be delivered through the next decade. I find it very unlikely that that will happen. I think we're about to have a large fight over even the existing pieces of the biofuels mandate. I don't want to get into a technical discussion about renewable identification numbers, but you know, we have some problems in the ethanol world. Uh, the two other places where you have a lot of talk is on natural gas and vehicles. So are we going to uh, start putting natural gas in our cars and trucks in a big way. I think we're, we're seeing some appetite for long distance trucking. For personal vehicles, I suspect it's less likely. I, I mentioned before this, uh, uh, this battery executive who bragged about his natural gas car. Then he pointed out that he happens to drive by the San Francisco airport on the way between uh, his home and his work every day. So he is able to stop every day or almost every day to fill up his car because you get about a quarter of the distance on the same, uh, on the same tank of gas. Of, of natural gas. So I think there's some pretty big barriers. You can put in home filling stations, but that's a pretty big incremental cost, and I'm not sure that people will uh, do that in a big way. Uh, you could see con more conversion of natural gas into liquid fuels, methanol, or into um, probably more likely into gasoline or diesel. But there are a lot of risks that a developer would take doing that. And we'll see what, um, what the Sasol project, uh, how far along it gets, and how the economics turn out. And the last piece, and, and I haven't left this for last it's, because it's the least important, is electrification. Uh, I started off as a bit more of a, a skeptic on, elect on electrification before I started reaching the book, researching the book, in part, uh, to be honest, because we'd cycled through hype and so many different technologies that I assumed that we were in the same cycle of hype on electric cars. We went through hydrogen fuel cells, then we went through biofuels, and so electric cars was next. Why shouldn't it turn out any differently? I, I was at least in part convinced by a senior engineer I, I met who talked about electric vehicles providing an evolutionary platform to develop technology. We've got huge penetration of hybrid cars, particularly globally. That allows you to learn a lot about how to deal with electric engines. Uh, then you can evolve from that uh, using existing infrastructure to plug in hybrids and then eventually in the places where it makes sense to fully electric cars. And I, I tend to believe that these evolutionary changes are more likely to happen than ones that require uh, infrastructure and technology and preferences to all change at the same time. Again, far from a given, but uh, because of this evolutionary opportunity, uh, I tend to actually see a lot of potential there. But it will take a long time. Uh, people replace their cars, as you know, every 15 years or so, or at least cars themselves turn over every 15 years or so. So any change takes a long time. I like that answer. OK, we have uh, one more time for one more question. So. Michael Aylward, um, I'm an economics graduate student. Um, first, just a quick sidebar. You mentioned the second last thing about oil dependence reduction, oil reduction strategies. There's a neat paper by a couple of EDF scientists last year on the global warming potential of several different strategies, one of which was replacing uh, long haul freight trucks with natural gas. And they concluded that it would not have any uh, climate mitigation benefits for at least 150 years. So that was an interesting uh, piece there. And that's even with conservative estimates on, or I should say liberal estimates on, uh, on methane fugitive emissions. 
Um, but I, my, my first, my, my question was uh, with respect to the Aspen Institute person, um, I, speaking of, of trades, possible trades for, uh, for Keystone XL, um, and speaking of your, your previous mention of the possibility that uh, less good or less responsible gas drilling actors in the U.S. could ruin it for the responsible ones. I wonder what you think about the possibility of a trade for more stringent or more prudent drilling regulations for a Keystone XL permit. So firstly, on, on the first piece of what you talked about, this EDF paper on, on methane, I think, Steve, when you outlined my bio at the beginning, used the word physics a bunch. I haven't written anything in physics for a dozen years. Last year, I got so frustrated at the methane debate that I actually published a couple of physics papers on it. Um, and I think it's just a muddy, muddy debate. Uh, a lot of that EDF paper is fantastic, but for the long haul trucks, it relies on decades old, old estimates that assume that the efficiency of engines in those trucks are about 20% worse than the efficiency of any other engine. And that drives the results in a very strong way. On trades, again, I'm not sure who would be doing the trading in that case. But I do think, stepping aside from pretending to be a political strategist, as a matter of good policy, allowing increases in oil production uh, to the extent that they're economic given prevailing prices, and at the same time, really making sure that we do this right so that it's safe, so that it's fair to people and communities where it's affected, and so we can continue to enjoy the benefits. I mean, as a matter of policy, that seems to me like a no-brainer. Uh, as a matter of politics, uh, it, like pretty much anything else these days, is pretty tough. All right. Um, Mike, thanks for doing your launch here at New America. Uh, the Power Surge, uh, Michael will be, be signing his book just out here. We have a few copies. Thanks very much for coming, and thanks, Mike, again.